Nice. What's going on, Kevin? How are you? I'm here in the airport. Just got denied at the Delta Sky Lounge because I was on a Southwest flight. <laughs> well, happy Friday, everyone. <laughs> Rich Swarbinski with the Mortgage <laughs> Collaborative here once again with the rundown with Rob and Rich, where we take you into the weekend by running through the week that was in the mortgage industry. Each week, normally joined by my esteemed colleague and co-host, Rob Crisman. Rob is out of the country for a few weeks. He, he called in impromptu from the country of Fiji last week. So who knows uh, what's ahead of us this week. And uh, in his stead, uh, his son, who's been on the show now for some weeks, Robbie Crisman. Robbie, who just bought a house, just bought a new car and uh, continuing with the theme of irresponsible millennial spending in America now in a casino. Do we do we like all black or, or sorry, all on black or on red? Do we have any preference? I always play black and odd. Black. Always, that's the only way I play roulette. I just even amounts on each, and you know. But I, I usually lose, so take it for what it's worth. Eleven is my favorite number. It's a black number. It's an odd number. I'll typically, you know, throw a little little on that number as well. But uh, and KP, I, this week uh tmc fan favorite somebody we go to all the time uh called him in this week and i believe he just landed in austin texas from nashville where he's there for the the uh you're there for a big football game kp right yeah man still a big game it's still coming so let's make it happen KP, you're having some audio issues. We heard a little bit of the, little bit of the end there, but uh, maybe I, maybe I stand too far from my phone. Um, <clears throat> yeah, is this any better? Perfect. Okay, I apologize. Yeah, we uh, we got Texas versus Alabama. So even though we're we're twenty point dogs, and I do bet on thirteen black and black. Uh, <laughs> you know what? You still got to play the game. You can't win if you don't play the game, right? Amen. <laughs> Definitely the biggest college football game this season. I'm sure it's going to be a scene in Austin uh, for that one this weekend. I, no chance you'll be taking any of that, those festivals. <laughs> I'm not taking the points. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's go ahead and get into it. By now, you know, we strive for interactivity with the show. Any questions, comments, thoughts? I see them already flowing in. A lot of KP love, some uh, hook and boys love. Wow, I got a yeah. gigum. We got Aggies. I didn't even know Aggies existed anymore. Uh, I got a SEC, SEC. Horns are going to get rolled. You know what? I'm still showing up, okay? I'm still coming here. I don't care what's going on in the industry. I don't care the odds stacked against us. I'm going to show up and I'm going to fight. And that's that's it. That's how we left our retail leadership conference yesterday. So it doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter the odds. You show up and you play to win. And that's it. That's all you can do. I love it, KP. We 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 went to KP this week. One because he's always you get you get no spin and great insight and typically pretty funny. Probably jinxed him now. Um, <laughs> but he's also a very positive guy. He's a guy that sees the best in everything. And as I was perusing through the headlines for this week's show, you know, mortgage rates in the mid sixes and apps at a twenty two year low. We, it's like we need a little KP love on the rundown this week. And uh, so thanks for accommodating us uh, around your travel. And thanks for taking one for the team and attending the Texas Alabama game tomorrow. I know it's top, <laughs> top sledding. Uh, I'm glad that you're going to show up and, uh, and uh, take in that horrible scene. So, you know, uh, it. let's go. <laughs> all right, let's get into it. Robbie, you know, the ever changing kind of crazy market dynamics really centering around inflation, fed actions and uh, pot job, Fed chair Jerome Powell, some more comments this week. He's just, you can't stop talking about how strongly committed he is to, to fighting inflation and, and made some more comments along those lines this week, talking about the soft landing. Although I have to admit now, when I hear Powell talk about a soft lending, sadly, the thing that comes to my mind is, is Ted Stryker, like sweating buckets at the end of the movie airplane, bringing the shaking plane uh, into the, uh, the runway. But that aside, um, so we saw an interesting market dynamic, though, to end the week. Stocks going crazy today. Dow's up over 400 points, really, really strong end of the week for stocks. But our, our woeful mortgage bonds, uh, not, we've, we've seen them moving the same normally. A uh, little deviation from that. You know, mortgage rates are up now. Not a, not a great week for the mortgage bond market. And what it's saying to me, Robbie, tell me if you agree, is the, the market, the broader market, is is 
confident, maybe more so than rational in the business climate because of things we're seeing, jobs and spending and things like that, um, but maybe not as confident in the Fed's ability to, to land that soft landing, hence what we're seeing with treasuries and bonds and fixed income. Your thoughts? I think the Fed has even admitted as much. They went from saying there's the potential of a soft landing to uh, Fed Chair Powell almost abandoning that last week in his comments to Jackson Hole. And he echoed that this week in his comments at the Cato Institute. And uh, markets are taking his comments more seriously than they were, which, which is a different discussion about why they weren't all summer long. But uh, between him and then Cleveland Fed President Mester this week, uh, coming across very hawkish, it, it, it seems that that word is getting through. And yeah, I'm with you. Normally, you'll you'll see uh, a, at least a, a loose correlation between what's going on in equity markets and, and the MBS market. But yeah, complete decoupling here over the last couple of days. So uh, you know, that, just, that adds to increased uncertainty, increased volatility, and uh, come to hedge pipelines. KP, my uh, my my Jerome Powell Ted Stryker analogy, unfair. Anything to it? Stryker, you're too low. You're too low, Stryker. I, I actually uh, am a big fan. And in fact, you talking just now about uh, the Fed, you made me change uh, a trade. Here we go. This is probably the first time that someone has bought 10 S&P calls live on the air with you guys. So I just, I just placed a trade. You got me even more fired up. You reminded me of what uh, <clears throat> I tried to do on the plane. And apparently my, my bid didn't go through. Uh, Robbie, by the way, you know, I love you, man. I, I so glad I got to finally meet you at the Western secondary a couple years ago down at, uh, Monarch beach, uh, the Waldorf Astoria. I love your commentary. Um, I told your dad, I read the first paragraph, which is his stream of consciousness. And I read the last paragraph, which is, uh, your, uh, your commentary. And it's just, it, it really gets my brain going and, and, uh, I can't thank you enough. Um, you know, the, the market is uh, rallying today because um, people think um, the, the whisper number for uh, the CPI next week is going to be low. And so um, remember, the Fed keeps talking tough. They keep talking about um, fight inflation, fight inflation, fight inflation. That's like all they're talking about now, right? At all costs, pain, 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 you know, whatever it takes. Well, if there is a negative 0.1% uh, monthly read, that comes out on CPI next month, that will replace last year's, uh, I believe it was 0.3% for the month of July or maybe, or, excuse me, August, or maybe it was 0.4. But anyway, um, you're gonna start to see the headline number come down. And if we have sustained uh, negative CPI prints month over month, especially when you get to October, the October 21 number was 0.9%. If that gets removed with another negative 0.1 or 0.2, um, you know, our good friend Dan Abib was even talking about this. They do a good job on NBS Highway. You could see one full percentage point come off the headline CPI number um, in November, right around the election, uh, just after the election, uh, when the October CPI number comes out. If the Fed is trying to fight inflation, and that's all they're talking about, and inflation comes down, well, number one, stock market's going to rip, um, which is why I just made my trade. Um, and that's why it's rallying today. <clears throat> so um, it's like it's like betting on black, right? It's like not quite 50-50 because they got the greens. By the way, they have they have triple zeros now. So there's three greens. So it's not so like if you bet on black, it's even worse than it was before. The house um, the house advantage wasn't strong enough. They had to add the extra zero. <laughs> don't don't fight the Fed and don't fight the house. Um, but um, you know, it's a process. And if inflation continues to come down, then eventually. The Fed will have uh, a three-step Fed pivot. They're going to raise in increments less than 75 basis points. They're going to pause as step two. And then at some point, they'll actually cut. Either one of those steps will uh, create the, uh, the boom in the stock market. I don't know necessarily that it'll have the effect on interest rates in our business until we see an actual Fed cut. Um, you look at the 10-year, it's been traveling upwards, about to touch on that 350 range again. It's around 330. Well, that's because, you know, I guess people, the smart bond traders are anticipating actual economic growth. They're seeing inflation become less of a problem and they're not seeing the demand and destruction cause of recession. So it's very interesting, a lot of uncertainty, but every data point that comes out that I read about, 
religiously in Robbie's work at the end of the Kristen blog. Uh, it's just one step closer to wherever the hell this train's taking us. KP, are you suggesting there's not as many retail bond traders uh, sitting at home in their uh, pajamas trading uh, bond meme stocks as there are stock traders? Yeah, the, 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 the meme traders are all going to uh, cheer on Texas here in Austin this weekend uh, with all of our Bitcoin money. Uh, <clears throat> yep, smart bond traders, they say they're the smartest people on Wall Street. They, they seem to have a pretty uh, keen eye on what's going on. And let's, let's be honest, they own trillions of dollars and they, they muscle and move markets. They move things around. They even sometimes can take their shots and bully the Fed around a little bit. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, I, I listen to bond traders and I listen to Robbie. <laughs> Robbie, good points by KP um, on the bond market. Um, and, and, and now it just seems to me like the bond market and bond traders, it, it's like the whole, I'm from Missouri, you got to really show me, you know, a couple good inflation numbers in a row aren't going to cause me as a bond trader to react the way a stock trader might KP buying calls live here on the show. Um, so is that your assessment of, of kind of where the bond market is at right now? My, when I was listening to KP talk, my, my initial thought was, even if headline inflation comes down by a percentage point, we're still at 8% inflation, 7.5% inflation. And the, uh, the real rate of inflation is, is still uh, highly positive. The Fed knows there's a two to three month or six to nine month lag, depending on who you ask, with their policy actions influencing markets. Uh, and there was talk in the past couple of weeks about maybe they should wait and see and kind of put the put the brakes on these rate hikes. But they are committed to getting the Fed funds rate up to over 4% and keeping it there into the new year. And that's that's what they've been indicating. Uh, you know, the, when, when you talk about the stock market, bond market, stock market seems decoupled from reality, in my opinion. Uh, I think I think the bond traders are the smart guys on Wall Street. I, I, I agree. And let me... <clears throat> Let me just ask you a question, just for the record, since it looks like you're in Vegas back there. Um, my my bet, I mean, excuse me, my uh, my trade was only six days, so it expires next week. So I I, I agree with what you said. I, I still think we're in a downtrend, uh, and and again, I am not uh, a financial advisor. I am not responsible for your losses, only your profits. Um, but what I will say is that um, we are still in a bear market um, until you know Missouri shows me. And uh, I, I agree. I mean, you know, we still have heightened inflation. I think uh, the market's seeing a little, you know, maybe a little bear market rally here with the inflation numbers. But I still think when the Fed hammers another 75 basis points, depending on what they say, the harsh reality of what Robbie just said uh, is, is absolutely still the reality of the trend. And the trend is your trend. Don't fight the Fed. Um, I, I have a question I can for Robbie. I, I heard Logan Motoshami, the lead housing analyst for um, housing wires say something very interesting, and I, I, I tend to agree with them, is that if you see the tenure going up, that is a bet on a growing economy. That is a bet uh, against recession. That is a bet against inflation. And, you know, if if we felt that, uh, or if bond traders felt that the inflation, like you said, is sustained and may not come back in line, and they felt it's really damaging, damaging enough to not be a soft landing, but to actually be a recession, Hell, we may already be one. I don't even know if we're on one or not. Well, I guess we'll find out in a year from now that the tenure would have to be going down as opposed to up. And and it's it touched down to that 255 level and it's been rocketing back up um, you know, the last uh the last couple of weeks or so. Do you think that's because bond traders think are it's not things aren't as bad that we are seeing a growing economy, or even with the sustained inflation you just talked about? that maybe it's not so bad and we and this is still a soft landing. We can handle that with the tight, strong labor market we got and everything else going for us. Might not be so bad. A lot, a lot of this recession was artificially manufactured between QE4 from the Fed uh, and then them now taking away the, the cookie jar. Uh, you know, the, the yield curve needs to maintain some sort of slope. And if the Fed funds rate is going to be at 4%, you're telling me a 10-year treasury, and that's the overnight lending rate between banks, you're telling me a 10-year treasury is going to be down at two and a half percent because of there is a recession. It, it seems like it, uh, I don't see it coming down until the Fed indicates that they're close to, to cutting rates. I also wanted to add on inflation, the decrease last month 
was due to energy prices. And we've seen gasoline go back up since then. So that is not going to be uh, pushing the headline inflation figure down like it was last month. Um, and, and on the theme of betting, I'm long all the energy companies. I mean, EOG, NOG, um, you name it. I mean, I, I, I'm with you. I, I think we haven't even gotten to the heart the, the heartache of uh, the Russia Ukraine issue that's going to come up and just, I mean, you can't, you cannot drive your car, but you can't not heat your house, you know, when it's cold in Europe or anywhere. So I, I, I think the nat gas thing is going to be a big deal. And I agree, oil, you know, all these oil companies are super profitable, even at $85 a barrel. You know, they get over 90, 95, 100 again. It's just a bonus for them and, and the traders. Um, I saw a good comment, by the way, and sorry to hijack you, Rich, but um, I saw a good comment uh, from Jen. To, do you, you don't think the 10 year rising is because bond traders expect inflation. And um, I, I do to a point, I just don't know what point that is. You know, like, you know, uh, we, we already know there's inflation. And on June 13th, the 10 year topped out at, at, at basically 348 uh, when everyone had the highest inflation fears. But inflation has been coming down since then. All the reads, are trending down and everyone keeps talking about peak inflation. So if that ship has sailed and bond traders are looking forward six months or more, three to six months, you know, are they, I, I, Jen, I don't know, you know, to answer your question. I mean, maybe 10 years are going up because they think this is a soft landing. Maybe it's a little bit of both. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just a higher range because the Fed rate's about to be higher. You know, I, I you know, to Robbie's point, but I, I don't know, but I'm, that's why I'm doing little swing trades six days at a time. I'm not, I'm not trying to get pinched <laughs> in a bear market. This is the rundown with Rob and Rich. I'm Rich Swabinski with the Mortgage Collaborative that joined this week by Rob's son, Robbie Crisman and Chief Lending Officer for PRMG, Kevin Peranio. Uh, KP, as you noted, bond markets are forward thinking. This is the industry of like stale headlines, right? Like, oh, hey, mortgage applications are down. Okay, that's from nine days ago, right? Oh, mortgage rates are the highest since whenever. Okay, but that's, you know, from again, seven to 10 days ago. And the, um, so what we have going on right now is, you know, a situation where it's 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 tough because it's kind of just gotten a little slower as this year's, it's, it's, a, it's, it's become for a lot of lenders a, a tough or, a hopeless scenario. Um, there is hope. This is a very cyclical industry. We're in a bad period right now. Um, but you know, remember last year when it was expected to be a bad year, we had one of the best years in the history of the industry. And you know, to your point, we've seen a lot of all the numbers that we've seen, the most important economic numbers, inflation, jobs, other things that we've seen these last three, four weeks have pointed to this soft landing. Stock market has reacted accordingly. To your point, bond market more guarded, more forward thinking. So let's lay out the scenario where we could get back to, you know, calendar year 2022, a 4% 30-year fixed rate that could have some really impactful um, momentum movement on purchase purchases and also cash out refinances. How, if for, for it to actually touch rate sheets, um, in your opinion, and, and I'd love to hear Robbie's as well, um, like the sequence of events in time, and it's a tough question to answer, I get it, that, that would most likely need to play out for, for that to materialize in, in impactful lowering of rate. Well, <clears throat> I, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. And uh, I, I think the roughest part for our industry is between now and February. Um, you know, you, you saw the MBS numbers come out for universal MBS, lowest since June of 2019 in a month. So we're back to 2019 levels. That was a big year. I mean, you know, you're doing $2 trillion in mortgages a year. You're, 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 you're doing great. And um, the problem is the industry is built right now for 4.6. And so if we do 2.3, this year, which I, I think the the final number would be closer to 2.3 trillion, uh, because I really I really think the next the rest of this year is going to be tough. Um, but it's still a lot of business. It doesn't feel like a lot of business. 
because there's so many loan ops, so many uh, call centers calling on trigger leads. There's so many ops, you know, staff at overinflated companies um, that haven't deleveraged yet. And so, you know, my my best case scenario is that a lot of the larger lenders um, or even some of the smaller lenders, you know, lenders whose CEOs decide to go out and stroke checks to buy production and then realize, oh shit, I'm losing money and I just paid money for guys that and girls that aren't originating loans. And when they do originate, they originate at a loss. Like they're gonna, they're accelerating their losses. And so duration is the, is the key here. Best case scenario is that all the big guys and all the hedge fund backed and banks keep pulling out of this channel, that channel. By the way, nobody's pulling out of retail. Um, they're pulling out of a low margin game, which is wholesale. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, math is math. You know, wholesale shrunk 16%. Purchase money is where it's at. And a lot of us on here are retail mortgage bankers, and we're deeply rooted in the community, and we've been hyper-focused on purchase business our entire career. That's not to say that brokers don't also do that. Different value proposition for this group right here, your audience. And um, we're grinding. You know, non-QM is uh, a great way to augment your typical business. And the purchases we do today will be the refis of tomorrow. It might be as early as February or March where we see some reprieve in rates. So all the purchases we're doing in the fives uh, or even sixes are gonna be refinances maybe next year plus the regular purchase cycle. And again, if it's a $2 trillion a year and bulk of its purchase business and a lot of the larger lenders have deleveraged or shed their capacity or pulled out or didn't have the stomach to take the losses, don't have the balance sheet, don't have the loan loss reserve, you know, spent too much money, took out debt to stroke checks, whatever, whatever, whatever. It will start to feel better, I believe, by February. But there's some pretty smart people that are betting that this drawdown could last as long as July of 24. So you think about the amount of pain it takes to last that long um, if companies are running out of loss. And so, uh, you know, we are very fortunate to have been profitable the first six months of the year without having to sell servicing. But that servicing asset we have, that $12 billion in servicing is a nice cushion for us, a nice asset. I know a lot of our members and, and collaborative members here, we were forced to service loans in the pandemic, and that's been a blessing for us. And, um, but there are some smaller lenders who don't have that cushion. And um, they will lose they will lose money faster. So, you know, it, everyone's going to navigate these waters. But um, again, once it's deleveraged and the capacity's down, when the rates do come back down, and they're not going to come back down to refinance all the loans we did in 2021 or 2020 at the lowest, cheapest money ever. I literally on my LinkedIn video was just talking about this last night. Uh, you know, who's going to who's going to want to refinance out of a house? With their 2.75 or three and a half percent, even if rates come back down to four, it's going to be the people we're putting in new homes today, first time home buyers in the five percent range. So uh, it is purchase money season, it's seasonal. This time of the year kind of sucks at that. Um, it gets a little bit better going into February and then spring purchase season. So I think the worst is the next six months, my opinion. But it's still plenty of business. You just got to go grind. You got to work twice as hard for half the money. <laughs> Well said, Robbie, lay out the bull case for the rest of 22. I'm going to channel my father, who's probably spearfishing uh, a Fijian uh, parrotfish right now, kind of like uh, Sean Connery in uh, Jamaica in the 1960s as Bond. But he would, he would tell you, yeah, for rates to come down, it's going to take another pandemic or a recession. Who wants either of those things? And... I guess best case scenario. Peloton. Is, is, Peloton. Do I cut out? Peloton. Oh, Peloton. Peloton. Yeah, they would love that. <laughs> no, no. But uh, the the scenario for rates coming down, if we're not talking recession, because I think a much more likely outcome from the Fed's actions is stagflation, where inflation remains high and, and growth moderates, is the volatility subsides and we're able to see some of these spreads that have widened, these mortgage-backed security spreads that have widened out and returned towards more normal levels. I think that's where you'll see it come down a little bit. And then, uh, not to not to belabor the point here, like, like we were talking about in the first segment, the Fed is committed 
to bringing inflation down, even if that means a hard landing, and even if that means economic pain for a lot of people. And that might not happen in, until into 2023. And, and like KP said, you know, it could take until 2024 for this bear market to play out. But the Fed being committed to that means rates will come down eventually. Uh, I think the question is how much economic pain is there along the way until we get there. It's going to be fascinating. I, you know, we're at such a crossroads right now as uh, our industry, the housing market more broadly, the economy more broadly than that. When you look at what has happened since the pandemic, some of the, you know, things that the pandemic accelerated or expired. Kay Schiller tells us home prices today nationally in America up 43% since the start of the pandemic on average. That's that in and of itself is an interesting dynamic inside of the housing market in America. We haven't seen that. Well, we know the last time we saw that. Um, you know, I, personally, I don't think, you know, what we've been kind of saying has been playing out for the last year. Home values are going to come down a little bit, right? We're starting to see that now. Um, they're still up 14, 15% over year over year as opposed to 19 or 20%, but they're, they're very incrementally, they're very incrementally going down. But uh, you know, the value part of it, I mean, I, I see home values subsiding another three, four percent, probably nationally on average, and then hitting a point where all this pent up demand um, eliminates any any future reduction in home values, KP. We've talked about this before. That's still the same way you see things. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the supply and demand imbalance, it's very interesting, you know, um, you know, we don't have people in a credit bubble. You know, you brought up the last time we had appreciation like this. That was based on a fake credit bubble. Um, the bubble we had was cheap money. And now that the money's not cheap, uh, you know, demand has come down. Uh, having said that, you know, there's still no supply. So, you know, I, I read these headlines and, you know, like you talk about like the stale news, you know, it's nine months for new new you know new construction once the house is done they're they're sold in less than 30 days it's still average like 21 days speaking of uh gambling numbers 21 days numbers are uh, as soon as a home is is built and finished they're gone they're not sitting on some lot yeah there's some time to get under contract there's some time to build you know it takes time to build houses what's crazy is the way houses are built in america there's two builders lennar and dr horton they control 53.5% of all single-family residence construction. Two builders. Nobody bailed them out in 08. So they're sitting on their hands right now. They're like, you know what? We don't need to go out and build a bunch of communities because we see the demand down as well. So, um, you know, supply can come down just as quickly as demand. And um, I still think we have a severe supply shortage. Cannot fight demographics, the wave of people that are first time home buyers. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, it's just awful. There's just no homes. I mean, we're already seeing the amount of listings decrease. Um, I follow this guy, Mike Simonson on Altos Research. He's unbelievable. He analyzes, his niche is super niche. He just analyze listing data. That's it. He will talk for an hour on listing data. It's fascinating, the insights. The listings typically increase heading up through October and then people stop listing homes for sale. Hey, you know what? We don't want to be like without a roof over our head during Thanksgiving and Kwanzaa and Hanukkah and Christmas and New Year's. Then they go back out and sell again. Listings are coming down now, earlier than normal. Where are these people going to go? Like if you're in the, the cheapest money ever in the house that you own from the last couple of years, and home prices are the highest they've ever been. You're going to sell your house to go buy a more expensive house with a more expensive rate? And investors aren't selling either. I mean, I own properties. I've never sold a property. I own, I own some properties. I'm not raising my rents. If the but federal I could. government put out a, a program where you could, uh, the uh, capital gains taxes were reduced or eliminated on the properties you own, would that? Would that cause you to consider to potentially sell some of those investment properties? No way, man. I've never, why would I ever sell a property? Dude, I, I use renter's warehouse. They send me a text. They find me a tenant. Oh, plumbing's done. 50 bucks to get it looked at, approved. Move on to my merry way and go gamble or whatever. 
You know, like I've, it's frictionless. It's the easiest time ever to be a landlord and rent goes up. At least with a mortgage, you could fix your, your loan payment. Rents are going up. There's not, now I will say the multifamily builders, they're really hustling to try and play catch up. And I think there's something there um, that will maybe catch up to the demographic wave and balance. Maybe the birth rate versus the death rate might cause something. I mean, Ivy Zellman reiterated her from cradle to grave approach. Like you said, Rich, she, she's calling for three to 4% depreciation in home prices next year and maybe another 6% the year after that. But so what if you went up 40 in the last two years? I mean, that's just a little... uh, I'm counting on at least five to eight percent off of where we are now. And I'm still, yeah, I bought a house a year and a half ago. I'm just happy, <laughs> you know. So you got a job, you, you know, you got your job, you're not, you know, you get you're getting paid, you're not forced to sell because you don't have the income to pay for the house that you're in mm-hmm. that has record equity, by the way. You could sell it in a heartbeat mm-hmm. um, and walk away with a check. So uh, yeah, brother, I, I just think the supply issue is just absolutely massive. And I, I don't know how we tackle it anytime soon. Robbie, comment in the chat. Uh, commenter says, I think the Fed will not allow us to go in the recession, regardless of inflation and lower rates if necessary. It would certainly put the Fed in an intriguing predicament if uh, inflation is still not under control, yet we're in a recession. Typically, the 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 number one tool in inflation fighting has been interest rate reductions by the Fed, but the obvious inflation potential implications. Uh, your thoughts on the commenter's point? I think the Fed will will allow us to go into a recession. However, we've seen that the mortgage space is kind of a sacred cow in the eyes of the government. They're not going to let the mortgage industry fail. They're going. The Fed is going to step in and do what they can, whether that's a, a fifth round of quantitative easing or whatever it may be. Uh, well, look, we're all on the same page. We don't want a recession to get inflation down, but the Fed has, has made it clear, especially over the last 10, 12 days here, that uh, they're willing to, to launch the U.S. economy into a recession in order to uh, achieve half of their dual mandate of price stability and, and long-run employment. KP, TMC, Chicago, coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, Going to be our biggest conference by far, um, which is great to see in this type of climate. We're doing a panel Tuesday morning on housing inventory in America. Jerry Howard, the uh, CEO of the National Association of Home Builders. We've got, we got Chris Herbert from the Harvard Joint Center of Housing that's done some really interesting analysis on just the demographics of Americans and home buying Americans. It's a topic that we have been talking about on this show for years now, trying to fi- figure it out. I mentioned, you know, the, the investment property, capital gains, tax, sunset, or removal is one idea that's been brought up. It, it, it really, I mean, the, you just summed it up perfectly. We've got a bad, you know, there's some uh, people out there that are contrarians, uh, Ivy Zellman being one of them, but by all accounts, we've got a housing inventory shortage in America, and we had one before the pandemic. And the pandemic, a bunch of things that have happened during it have accelerated this to the point where it's, you know, potentially very unhealthy tailwinds to this. It, it seems to me like the idea that, like the type of issue and problem, maybe that doesn't need complete government intervention, but at the very least, creative solutions all the people you talk to you're as dialed in as anybody is there any creative solutions to the housing supply issue in america that we're not thinking about or talking about that uh you know may be a little unconventional but but something that could help move the needle well um yeah there's a couple and it 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 doesn't typically involve the government right they always tend to muck things up but um by the way those are great guests i mean harvard joint center for you know the housing studies, I mean, their articles are unbelievably uh, well-written. Um, Don Layton's always commenting in there too. Um, and then the National Association of Home Builders, I mean, I can't wait to hear what they have to say. I hope it's not too early because you know how I go out at your events all night, um, every night. Um, by the way, I just did four nights of 4 a.m. Um, in a row in Nashville. So um, I'm on fumes here. Um, I, I, will, I, will, I will tell you that... Um, you know, the way housing is done, you know, and look, I love Ivy Zellman. I, I, I had a chance to speak with her when the pandemic first started. Barry Habib put me on the phone with her. We talked with her and her, her team. 
Um, I subscribe to their research. I give them our data. Um, unbelievable uh, group over there, which by the way, Walker and Dunlop uh, bought uh, Zellman Associates. Remember, she, she has always catered to the builder community. And so when a lot of her, her theses are, you know, catered towards large builders and think about those two builders I talked about, D.R. Horton and Lennar. Mm -hmm. They go buy land years in advance, finish it out, permit it, zone it. Then they start building in this section of town, which is usually outside of town. You know, I mean, that's how, that's how building at scale is done. And so if builders hold back and there's less inventory on the market, you start to look at custom home builders or, you know, I'm doing house shipping on the side uh, in you know, Palm Desert, Culver City with a buddy, um, you know, teardowns of old houses. If there was some kind of subsidy or way to help out um, with new product on the market, with larger room count for, you know, regentrification in neighborhoods, that could help. But I honestly think where, uh, where we're really going to see a, a, a true tipping of the imbalance of being severely undersupplied. Um, is with uh, deflationary technology in home building. And I know this sounds so stupid and crazy, but you asked for it. But 3D printed homes, that's a real thing, brother. I've seen them, uh, you know, out Rancho Mirage, I have a condo and there's a whole community that they just printed. That the, you know, it's not like a printer, right? But it, it is this machine that just pours concrete and just goes back and forth and pours concrete homes. And the homes are built in three months. I mean, that, that cheap, cheap material, concrete instead of lumber, right? Speed, three months at scale. If there was some subsidy for some deflationary tech, I mean, I, you know, these pod homes that, you know, they didn't quite take off, you know, these containers, shipping container, built out homes that didn't really take off, but something that would be uh, revolutionary, like printed homes and a deflationary new technology which I agree with Robbie, stagflation is, is a fear. Deflation is always a fear of the Fed. Technology is very deflationary. So um, we're literally sitting on a supercomputer right here that didn't cost us that much to build. When Big Blue came out, it was like, you know, tens of billions, right? We, these things, these cell phones we have are, are more powerful than that. So I think deflationary tech with, a, with perhaps 3D printed homes at scale with maybe some government backing behind it, I mean, they just backed the CHIPS Act. They backed CHIPS. They backed all these ESG initiatives. Maybe 3D printed homes will go down as an ESG initiative. I don't know. But I, I think that's the only way to really tip the imbalance of undersupply. I love it. That's a great idea. I, if I remember correctly, nothing specific was mentioned about that. But I think in the Biden housing supply plan, there was a, a, a tidbit about you know wanting to uh, further explore deflationary technology for home builders that could help homes be built quicker, more efficiently. You would seem to think like the home building a process in America is, is really seems inefficient. The way just things are built, even large things, it is so just manual and just stage. Like I, it, it seems like that, uh, you know, some technology and uh, a refreshed uh, approach could could be part of the solution. There. And, Rather, and, and, that's all, and that's also a bad thing, right? I mean, currently for every new home built, in America, it creates four jobs, yep. creates four jobs. So, um, you know, deflationary tech on 3D printed homes, you know, will there'll be a little hit there, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, I think everyone's going to look back on this period and talk about the side hustle, the gig economy. I mean, why are there 11 million jobs open right now? Yeah. Everyone's doing some shit on the side. Yeah. You know, they're all doing something, you know, extra thousand dollars a month here, 500 bucks a month there, selling something on Etsy or eBay or or whatever. And, you know, so I, I don't know, those construction jobs might go, but there's a lot of side hustles going on for people. And I think that's a big reason why these, I mean, people are literally baffled that there's 11 million jobs open right now. And, and I, I don't think it's that baffling. I think people are getting under the table money, which by the way, there's 87,000 IRS agents that could come find you. Uh, but you know, they got their, uh, they got their side hustle. They got their side gig. It's a gig economy. And um, so something to think about, um, you know, just in this whole macro picture. Robbie, you just went through the home buying process. Anything America is missing on the supply issue, a creative solution, uh, something that could move the needle? Well, I, KP, I know you prefer 
week long bets and less, but home builder stocks are my stock pick for next year. They, they traditionally have a, a big rebound after, after recession. You're chuckling. Maybe you disagree with me. No, no, no. <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking up the, the home builder stocks while you talk as we speak. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully they've gone way down. You got to buy at the bottom. But anyways, uh, I agree. Talks, I agree with that, actually. We talked about this last week a little bit, Rich. There's, there's creative solutions out there, whether that's ADU that, you know, they bring a crane to your lot and they set it up in a couple hours or this automated concrete pouring technology KP mentioned. I just don't see, you know, de demand is there, yes, because supply has, has gone through this huge destruction process. But if mortgage rates are 6%, there's not going to be a crazy amount of demand out there, uh, regardless of what the market. So uh, I know I know my friends as millennials, they, they do have home ownership goals and dreams, but it's, they're happy to wait on the sidelines for a little while longer in, a, in an environment like this, even if more supply was to be out there. And uh, yeah, all the stats and polling, yeah, really does indicate that there is a large amount, a lot of them being younger people that are just kind of, uncertain and confused by the whole housing market right now that are on the sidelines that aspire to be homeowners hopefully soon um but you know for right now kind of on the sideline so it's uh a crazy time for the industry and, uh, and my, my thought my thought also rich if you want solutions is duplexes are great you pay off your pay off your mortgage payment you can find something where you qualify and uh Obviously, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have said their their commitment is not towards second homes or investment properties. But if you're able to qualify for something that has strong cash flow, as KP alluded to, you know he doesn't want to sell any of his properties. And investment properties are are a solid investment. Four hundred thousand dollar home with twenty percent down today. The P and I payment seven hundred dollars higher than January. So think about that. Think about the impact to uh, yeah, just Americans and. Uh, think about the importance to our industry of, of what Jerome, uh, Jerome Powell and the Fed are, are doing right now. Um, inflation is a killer to bonds because they return a fixed return. Uh, inflation eats away at that. And, um, you know, if we want, okay. it's a good point, Robbie, I, you know, I, we're not going to see values plummet. So to get real needle movement on demand, we're going to have to have lower rates lower rates to all of our points from throughout the show, putting a bow on this thing, you're really gonna have to show the bond market. You really have to show the bond traders. Like we have un inflation under control. And, um, but uh, like I said, the, the last several numbers have been good. KP mentioned the whisper number for uh, next uh, Wednesday CPI. Uh, I've saw, seen the same people are anticipating. It could be good for America and inflation makes it even crazier that bonds are selling off today really shows you that that the bond traders are from Missouri right now KP right <laughs> well <clears throat> I I just Robbie just I'm not all short-term bets but I do like uh the XHB that's a good ETF um on home builders um 55 was it's at, it's at 61 dollars right now and and 55 is their uh let's see their 52 week low, it's 62.18. And it just had a nice little bounce off of 60. So I'm with you, brother. I, I do like that bet. If you want to trade a basket ETF, get the uh, tax advantages of, of trading an ETF versus you know, your passive investment. Um, and uh, yeah, home builders are, I mean, again, there's the, the top two have 53.5% of all single family re residence construction. I mean, it's, un, it's unbelievable that it's come to that, but the government didn't bail them out. So you know, they take in their sweet ass time. I like, I like your, I like your bet. Oh, long well, TLT. There we go. And Mark, Mark going long TLT. He's, he's, well, he's into treasuries. I don't mess with treasuries. A lot of great stuff in the chat this week. If you listen on podcasts, where I know the majority of people listen, join our live broadcast. Uh, we're up almost at uh, 300 this week. It's fun. It's interactive and uh, get a chance to see a host and guests in person and uh, interact with the show. So uh, but as well, always, plus, plus you have Derek, you've got Derek, you know, the only smart one in the comments there. Hook him, buddy. <laughs> that's, my, that's my alma mater. 
And so Robbie went to UT. KP is yes. going to the game this weekend. We know what we know what your Saturday, uh, both of you guys, is going to be comprised of. But... <laughs> Cry, crying <laughs> after the game, yes. No, yeah, no way. I so Robbie, I went from '94 to '98 to UT, and the first thing I did when I landed is I got Salt Lake barbecue brisket and sausage with their incredible German potato salad and coleslaw and beans with a nice pint of Shiner Bock. I mean. Oh. Got it doesn't it. get much better than that on a Friday afternoon. And then I get to hang out with you guys. Life's good. You, that's illegal to bring that all up at uh, 345 on a Friday. I got like another hour. <laughs> to work with you, so. But, uh, well, uh, hey, KP, thanks for joining us on somewhat short notice. As always, uh, uh, failed to disappoint and uh, great insight and uh, optimism from you, as always, and appreciate you joining us. Thank you. And Robbie? Good uh, to see you once again, and uh, yeah, really enjoyed having you on the show, and uh, no uh, impromptu drop-in uh, from your dad uh, from uh, Parts Unknown uh, this Friday, but uh, once again, uh, great job in his absence, I, I'd argue maybe even better than your dad, so. Not a chance, but always, as always, appreciate you having me on, thank you. I, I can't, I cannot let a show go by with getting at least one shot in it, Rob, so I, I waited. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, and as always, to our attendees, thanks for wrapping the week up with us. Uh, we're here every Friday live from uh, 3 to 3.45 p.m. Eastern with the Rundown with Robin Rich. And you can find us on YouTube and podcast TMC Connect, where you find us on podcast. So till next Friday, have a great weekend and rest of the week, everyone. KP, Robbie, have a great weekend. Take care, guys. See you guys in Chicago. Hook them. Hook them. <laughs>